praise Him, you angels and heavenly host. Let the whole earth praise Him. Praise Him, the sun, moon, and bright shining stars. Praise Him, you heavens and waters and skies. Let the whole earth praise Him. Great in power, great in glory, great in mercy, King of heaven, great in battle, great in journey. Welcome to Father's Day. I have kind of an odd relationship with Father's Day because for many years <coughs> Father's Day fell on the Sunday of annual conference and there was a long stretch when I was gone that day and then we we figured out later on a way that we could share that with my parents because they were lay members of, of the same annual conf, conference from their church. So that, that was kind of a neat thing. Uh, and then after I retired, we kind of figured out how to celebrate it on our own. Anyway, welcome fathers. Welcome all of you who have fathers. It looks, looks like some of our fathers and families have gotten there for uh, early brunch or whatever else is, is going on with them. But we will all celebrate. Funny thing, ooh. Funny thing happened to us yesterday. We had scheduled a lead team meeting and there were a number of things we were going to, going to work on. And the technology just bit us. It was just ugly. And we finally figured out we just had to pull the plug and we're going to try again. One of the things we were, we were going to do officially is roll back some of our COVID protocols. Uh, and there's some, some technical reasons why we need to do that officially. But things like um, who wears masks when. Probably we will find ourselves saying if you're, if you're vaccinated, you don't need a mask at all on Sunday morning. Uh, but we just need to be able to say it the right way. So thank you for being patient, patient with us for that for a little bit longer. Uh, we have called in the um, 911 tech squad. And we're gonna do our very best to be sure that that one doesn't happen again. It was odd. All right, this morning, we're going to be talking about the story of David and Goliath. I told our district superintendent that the other day uh, when we were talking and he said, sounds like a nail biter, I wonder who wins. <laughs> I want to invite you to approach it with that kind of freshness. We've, we've all heard the story dozens, even hundreds of times, and we could all probably all tell it to each other. But uh, as it unfolds this morning, let's see if we can approach it like we're hearing it for the first time. All right. 
going to invite you to stand, and Lana's going to lead us as we begin our worship together. Good morning. We yearn, oh, yeah, we're waiting for the, the slide to change. We yearn to be in the presence of the Holy One. In the house of prayer. To walk beside still streams. To behold the radiance of creation. To sing our matchless joy. To offer a sacrifice of service. To dwell all our days enfolded in the love of God. sense of your transcendent holiness as we come into your presence. Enable us not only to hear your call, but to respond to it, not only to listen, but to understand. Give us today ears to ear, eyes to see, a mind to understand, and a heart to follow. Equipped by your spirit, may we abide in your service until the whole earth sees and celebrates your glory through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our scripture today is from 1 Samuel 17, 1 through 49, but they are selected verses, and they'll be read in two parts. The Philistines drew up their troops for battle. King Saul and the Israelites came together, camped at Oak Valley, and spread out their troops in battle readiness for the Philistines. The Philistines were on one hill, the Israelites on the opposing hill, with the valley between them. A giant, a giant nearly 10 feet tall stepped out from the Philistine line. Goliath from Gath had a bronze helmet on his head and was dressed in armor. 126 pounds of it. That's a lot. <laughs> he wore bronze shin guards and carried a bronze sword. His spear was like a fence rail. The spear tip alone weighed over 15 pounds. His shield bearer walked ahead of him. Goliath stood there and called out to the Israelite troops, why bother using your whole army? Pick your best fire and pit him against me. 
If he gets the upper hand and kills me, the Philistines will all become your slaves. But if I get the upper hand and kill him, you'll all become our slaves and serve us. I challenge the troops of Israel this day. Give me a man. Let us fight it out together. When Saul and his troops heard the Philistines' challenge, they were terrified and lost of all hope. Each morning and evening for 40 days, Goliath took his stand and made his speech. David was the youngest of Jesse's eight sons. Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul to war. Their names were Eliab, Abinadab, and Shammah. One day, Jesse told David his son, take this sack of cracked wheat and these 10 loaves of bread to your brothers in the camp, and take these 10 wedges of cheese to the captain of their division. Check in on your brothers to see whether they are getting along all right, and let me know how they're doing. Saul and your brothers and all the Israelites in the war with the Philistines in the Oak Valley. David arrived at the camp just as Israel and the Philistines were moving into position, facing each other, battle ready. David ran to the troops who were deployed and greeted his brothers. While they were talking together, Goliath stepped out from the front lines of the Philistines and gave his usual challenge. David heard him. David asked the men standing around, what's in it for the man who kills the Philistine and gets rid of this ugly blots on Israel's honor? Who does he think he is anyway? This uncircumcised Philistine taunting the armies of God alive? The bold things David was saying were reported to King Saul. Saul went for him. Master, said David, don't give up hope. I'm ready to go and fight this Philistine. Saul answered David, you can't go and fight this Philistine. You're too young and inexperienced. He's been fighting since before you were born. Good morning. Welcome to Children's Time. One of the good things about this time of year, unlike last year though, is the idea of school being out and families being able to go on vacations, right? Amusement parks like Disneyland and Six Flags are often the desired destination because of the rides and the fun that comes from riding them. However, there are rules about who can ride them. Usually there's a sign at the entrance that looks like this one. I was just hearing about a situation from a friend of mine about how his younger son was excluded from a ride because of his height. He was really bothered that he could not ride the ride, but his brother could. I know that coming, just coming to those signs to be measured can sometimes bring on ex intense anxiety. Those height sticks are like a test that you could not study for and could do nothing to pass. So I wondered, why are there rules about this? I found that theme parks impose height restrictions not because kids below that height are too short to fit on a ride or enjoy it. In normal operation, even babies could go on Thunder Railroad and some other coasters safely. Height and other restrictions protect riders in case something goes wrong, such as the stopping of a safety break or having to be evacuated. In those rare cases, people under the designated height could be at extreme risk. So that makes sense that they would have those precautions, right? All things happen in due time, even getting to ride the big rides. Most parks have even created areas with rides that don't have those height requirements. So what does all this have to do with this today's scripture from 1 Samuel? Well, we just heard how David, the youngest and therefore smallest son in his family, wanted to volunteer to fight Goliath, but was told by King Saul that he was too young and inexperienced. That kind of sounds like King Saul was putting up a height requirement sign, doesn't it? The good news, though, is that our size doesn't really matter to God. He doesn't care if we're short or tall, fat or skinny, young or old. Just because you're small doesn't mean you're weak to God. Goliath looked strong on the outside, 
but real strength is on the inside. David, David had God on his side, and that is stronger than anything. God doesn't look at the outside of a person. He looks at the inside of a person. He looks at the heart. So no matter how old you are, God thinks every person is important. In other words, God doesn't have a height requirement sign to do his work. With God's help, we can do lots of important things and even great things. If we ask God, he will always help us. Small people can do big things with the help of God. Could God use you to do something special for him? Use your heart to help you answer that question. Hey, thanks for joining me today on Children's Time, and I'll see you next week. Bye. I'm ready for this nail biter to end. <laughs> Master, David said to Saul, don't give up hope. I'm ready to go and fight this Philistine. Saul answered David, you can't go fight this Philistine. You are too young and inexperienced. He's been fighting since before you were born. David said, I've been a shepherd tending to, my, tending to sheep for my father. Whenever a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I'd go after it, knock it down, and rescue the lamb. If it turned on me, I'd grab it by the throat, wring its neck, and kill it. Lion or bear, it made no difference. I killed it. And I'll do the same to this Philistine pig who is taunting the troops of God alive. God who delivered me from the teeth of the lion and the claws of the bear will deliver me from this Philistine. Saul said, go, and God help you. Then Saul outfitted David as a soldier in armor. He put his bronze helmet on his head and belted his sword over the armor. David tried to walk, but he could hardly budge. David told Saul, I can't even move in this stuff on me. I'm not used to this, and he took it all off. Then David took his shepherd's staff, selected five smooth stones from the brook, and put them in the pocket of his shepherd's pack. With his sling in his hand, he approached Goliath. As the Philistine paced back and forth, his shield bearer in front of him, he noticed David. He took one look down on him and sneered, a mere boy, apple-cheeked and peach-fuzzed. The Philistine ridiculed David. Am I a dog that you come after me with a stick? Come on, said the Philistine. I'll make roadkill of you for the buzzards. I'll turn you into a tasty morsel for the field mice. David answered, you come at me with sword and spear and battle axe. I come at you in the name of God of the angels' armies, the God of Israel's troops, whom you curse and mock. This very day, God is handing you over to me. The whole earth will know there's an extraordinary God in Israel. And everyone gathered here, here will learn that God doesn't save by means of sword or spear. The battle belongs to God. He's handing you to us on a platter. That roused the Philistine. He started towards David. David took off from the front line, running toward the Philistine. David reached into his pocket for a stone, slung it, and hit the Philistine hard in the forehead, embedding the stone deeply. The Philistine crashed face down in the dirt. The world's tallest human was born February 22, 1918, in Alton, Illinois. Robert Pershing Wadlow weighed in at eight pounds, six ounces. Immediately, he began doing what babies do. He grew. At three months, he weighed 30 pounds. At 18 months, he weighed 67 pounds. It gets better. <laughs> when he turned five years old, he was five feet four inches tall and weighed 105 pounds. None of the stores in Alton, Illinois, carried eight-year-old Robert's clothing size. His parents became very well acquainted with the local tailor. Ten-year-old Robert was six feet, six feet five inches, weighed 210 pounds, and wore size 17 and a half shoes. Yes. <clears throat> 
The Boy Scouts named 13-year-old Robert the tallest Boy Scout in the world at seven feet four inches. Graduating senior Robert Wadlow was eight feet four inches tall and weighed 391 pounds. Yes, he looked down on his classmates. Robert died in 1940 at the age of 22. Guinness World Records still lists him as the tallest human on record at 272 centimeters, 8 feet, 11.1 inches. Robert, Whitlow, Robert Wadlow was a gentle giant. Most of the giants who trouble our lives are anything but gentle. The devastating COVID giant has killed 605,000 people in this country and more than 3.8 million worldwide. Its army of giants that's, that follow, it includes record unemployment, prolonged financial uncertainty, comprehensive chaotic change. Don't expect these giants to leave quietly. New variants of the virus continue to emerge. COVID survivors and their families will deal with after, after effects perhaps for the rest of their lives. And you know, as well as I, that COVID is just one of a horde of giants roaming our world. Climate change and assorted addictions defy our best efforts to change their trajectory. Ideological polarization, social, political, cultural, religious, sets us against our neighbors. Deeply ingrained racism has left deep wounds in our common life. The continuously accelerating pace of change widens generation gaps and pushes the, the pace of daily life to unhealthy levels. And you know what worries me most? We've barely begun to name the giants that terrorize our hopes, our dreams, and our nightmares. So I won't name any more. The story invites us to look beyond life's fearsome giants. It proclaims that life's giants are strong, but God's power is vastly stronger. Goliath's booming voice and massive presence struck paralyzing fear into those Israelite soldiers. But inexperienced, too young, David overcame the fear with faith. Apple-cheeked, peach-fuzzed David met Goliath's challenge and left the giant face down in the dirt. The story says that Goliath was nearly 10 feet tall. There's some <clears throat> discrepancy in the original manuscripts, and he may have only been closer to seven feet, but that was still well over a foot higher than the tallest ordinary folks in, in those days. Goliath was armed with state-of-the-art technology. Supposedly wiser and more experienced men, yes, they were all men, had already concluded that the battle against Goliath was hopeless. But David brought fresh eyes, fresh faith, and fresh hope to this hopeless battle. David reminds the, sol the soldiers who they are, the army of God alive. David testifies, God who delivered me from the teeth of the lion and the claws of the bear will deliver me from this Philistine. David's tough talk reaches King Saul's ears. Saul summons him, and David says, don't give up, don't give up hope. I'm ready to go and fight this Philistine. He proclaims the faith Goliath had apparently scared out of Israel's army. God who delivered me from the teeth of this lion and the claws of the bear will deliver me from the Philistine. And everybody knew what would happen. Too young, inexperienced David was no match for that towering giant. 
But David's faith right-sizes the giant who's paralyzed Israel's army. We know God will be faithful because we know God has been faithful. Remember God's faithfulness to you and your tribe. What has God brought us through? What doors has God opened when we thought life had dead-ended? How have we heard God's yes over the world's or the giant's no? Trust God to lead us beyond that dead end into new, more, richer, deeper life. That incredible hulk of a 10-foot Philistine giant wasn't the make-or-break issue that day. The make-or-break issue was Israel's anemic, shriveled-up faith. David insists that the God who's been with him will be with him also against Goliath. And Saul believes him, sort of. I think he wants to believe David, but can't quite get there. Go, he says. God help you. You're right. That doesn't sound like a battle cry or a pep talk. That sounds like last rites. Go ahead. Go fight him. God help you. Beneath his words, we can hear Saul wonder, what will be left of Goliath, of David, after Goliath finishes with him? Will there even be recognizable remains? How will I ever explain this to David's family? Go, David. God help you. Saul equips David the way he, Saul, would go into battle. He gives David his own armor to wear. Saul straps his own sword over that oversized armor that encases David. He places his heavy bronze helmet on David's head. Bronze, by the way, was one of the state-of-the-art medals in that era. So David has armor and a sword and a helmet, and at least he looks like a soldier. Or does he look more like a boy playing soldier? I can't even move with all this stuff on me, David says. Of course not. Saul may well have been a foot taller and a good deal heavier than King David. David can't fight the giant Saul's way. He doesn't need to. He knows that God has called and equipped him for this moment just as he is. David brings his deep faith. He brings all he's learned in his years of protecting sheep against deadly enemies with just his own wits and minimal resources. David brings his youth, his fitness, and the blessing of not knowing the way we've always done it. He brings his sling. In his hands, that sling was a precision weapon. Folks who've done some tests have estimated that a stone from a well-aimed sling like David's may have had the stopping power of a 45 caliber bullet. High-tech warriors like Goliath might have scoffed at David's sling until it put them face down in the dirt. God has equipped each of us with all we need to face the giants who threaten us. I don't need that magic gadget I saw on the internet last week. I don't need to do my weak imitation of that Facebook wannabe celebrity. You know, the one who will send you a magic formula for a perfect life for only $99.95. I don't need to put on an identity or an ideology that doesn't clearly fit me. God has made me who I am. Not perfect, but one of God's children created in God's image. I'll bring my own gifts, skills, resources, 
when it's time to face my giant. I'll ask for help when I need it because God has also equipped me with people and resources to rely on. They can help me focus my struggle on that giant. But I'll start with who I am, what I have, and how God is already at work in my life. That's true for my personal giants or family giants like illness, unemployment, major life transitions. It's true for our life together as the church. Countless authorities offer us the ready-made solution for all our problems. Trouble is, there is no such thing. One size doesn't fit all. Paul would tell us, now you are the body of Christ here and now on Sunrise Mountain. Each part of Christ's body is a unique faith community called together to serve and bless their neighbors as far as they can reach. No one can serve these people of God in this part of God's world as well as we can. So let's review. First step is right-sizing our giants. Shift the focus from fear to faith. From that, don't focus on that big ugly giant's big ugliness. Focus on God's faithfulness. Our God, God alive as David calls him. God alive has brought us this far. God alive will bring us through whatever's next. Second, don't wear somebody else's armor. It won't fit. It won't be comfortable. You'll look ridiculous. You won't be able to fight your way out of a paper bag. Be your best God-created self. Be the wonder God created you to be. Yes, we can always improve. It's also true that God don't make no junk. Every one of God's children is gifted and called for his or her role in fulfilling God's purposes. The starting point for facing a giant is to remember who we are, the gifts God has given us, the strengths we bring to this moment. That strength includes our connection to one another in a congregation like this and in the wider body of Christ. A while back, we talked about how large our wingspan is as a faith community. We were talking about some NBA players, you know, they all measure their wingspan. And the, there are some in the NBA whose wingspan is a foot, wa- foot more than what the average wingspan is. Don't underestimate our wingspan. We can use that wingspan, hmm, first of all, to find my place. <laughs> use that wingspan to, to accomplish more and to reach farther than we thought we could. Don't, ester- under, don't underestimate yourself. David's good word and good choices meant nothing until he picked up those smooth stones from the brick, took his sling, ran toward Goliath, loaded his sling, and let the stone fly. The last word when it comes to facing our giants is act. Otherwise, all we've done is kill trees to make paper for all our carefully crafted mission and vision statements and strategic plans. Otherwise, all we've done is to ramp up global warming as our seemingly endless talk pumps carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. David talked a pretty good game, good enough to get the king's ear. He'd been wise enough to know God had called him just as he was. 
he tried on Saul's armor just long enough to realize that's not who he was. God hadn't called David King Saul's latest pal for a day. He'd called David the shepherd who'd fought wild animals after his sheep. David knew all these preliminaries had a single purpose. His good words and good choices focused in the moment he picked up those smooth stones, loaded his sling, ran toward Goliath, and let that stone fly. I doubt that any of us are called to literally sling a stone at a giant anytime soon. But all of us have giants lurking somewhere in our lives. Ask for help when you need it. Remember that you are God's precious child, called and equipped for this moment. Remember that the God who has brought you this far accompanies you on the next part of your faith journey. Don't take any more stuff than you need. Keep it simple, sister and brother. Keep it simple, keep it focused, and when the time is right, act. Our faithful ac action brings David's promise to life for all within our reach. The whole earth will know that there's an extraordinary God. Amen. Please join me in the prayer. Mighty, powerful God, speak to us anew your words of majesty and love. We are surrounded by the noise of uncertainty, anxiety, and division. We long for a fresh encounter with your powerful presence in our midst. To all who feel fearful and powerless, speak your life-giving words. We lift up all who feel alone and unloved, whose hands no one holds, whose names have been forgotten. Speak to them, to us, to all your children. We pray for all who face overwhelmed crisis physical, mental, or spiritual crisis, personal, family, social, global crisis. We pray for all who feel overwhelmed, about to drown as they struggle. Tell them, tell us, tell all your children. We pray for all who face personal trials in their communities, their families, their relationships, their calling, Tell them, tell us, tell all your children. Because we forgot so often, O oh God, remind us all of your love for us, for all your children, for all creation. Tell us all once more. As you speak to us, may we sense your presence and hear your love. Empower us to share your loving presence with all who long for you. In the name of your loving and comforting Son, as Jesus taught us to pray, our Father. One of the things that COVID has helped churches do is to rethink our offering. When we were not in person, we had to find some other ways to do that. And as we're coming back together 
there are lots of folks in lots of different places thinking about how we'll, how we'll, we'll share our offerings as we, as we move forward. Somewhere along the line uh, in that process, <clears throat> I started an automatic withdrawal. And um, Diane and I know that that happens every week. And I see an email every week that says it was done. And it's very simple. So that's, that's one way we do that. Um, we stopped passing the plates from person to person to person, partly because we were, we were fighting germs or, originally. We are experimenting now with having the plates on the back as you, at the back as you go out. Um, they will get bigger and the signs will get larger if you miss them too often. But um, this also gave us a chance to think a little bit more about how to make that a more meaningful time. And one of the things we're going to try for, for a while is to think, to use this as an opportunity to think about our membership vows. Now, you're welcome to think along with us whether, you're, whether or not you're a member of this congregation or ever intend to become one. One of the, the commitments we make is that we will support the church with our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. Now you probably can see already that practically anything you, you do in the life of the church brings most of those and, and they overlap. But we're gonna isolate them out just a little bit so we can think about them in the weeks ahead. And so next week we'll be thinking briefly, more, brief, more briefly than this probably, about how we support the church with our prayers in the following week with presents and so on and so forth. And we hope that'll, that'll help us think beyond this being just a financial transaction to, to help it become a spiritual whole church transaction. So use this time if you choose to, to consider your offering today and in the days ahead. And Lana is going to lead us in prayer as we dedicate our offerings. Oh, after an offering and song. <laughs>
will not overtake me. I am pressing into you. Lord, you fight my every battle, and I will not fear. I am not alone. I am not alone. You will go before me. There are struggles and battles all around us. There is a need and pain and struggle. And too often we feel powerless and inadequate to do anything. Yet, like David, who in faith went to meet Goliath, we have been provided all we need to serve you in the world. May the offering we made this morning reflect our understanding that we have all we need to live and that we have all we need to serve you as you have called us. In your holy name we pray. Amen. We invite you to stand as you're able and join us in our closing song, Every Giant Will Fall. There's pain within the plan. There is victory in the end. Your love is my battle cry. When my fears like Jericho build their walls around my soul. When my heart is overthrown, your love is my battle cry.
Now go into the world and to face your giants in the peace and power of God. Focus beyond fear to faith, to the God who has brought us this far and the God who will take us on the next step of our journey. Focus, remember who you are, how God has equipped you, how God calls you for what happens now and what happens next. And when the time comes, act. Be what God calls you to be. Do what God calls you to do so that the whole world will know our extraordinary God. Go in the peace and power of God. Amen. Every child.